And uh, sometimes there are these beautiful things on television, special 30 minute programs, just dedicated to remembering this famous person who died. And they never get to see it. They, they would probably enjoy that very much, you know. And uh, so I got to read all, all kinds of really sweet obituaries today about how uh, wonderful I was and how good it was to know me. And uh, you know, it was very nice. I almost felt a little bit hesitant to write back thanking them because they might feel it's like a voice from the dead. Um, I remember after 9-11, I you know, can't make fun of 9-11 but I bought the, uh, a hard copy of the New York Times. <coughs> I have a thing, I, I save a few uh, historic newspapers. These of course were the days when people read newspapers rather than getting their news off the internet. And I, I remember getting the September 12th New York Times and uh, they had a special, well maybe it was, a, you know, it was the following Sunday and they had a special, insert listing every guy who died by then or every by then they knew like almost everybody who died was not accounted for and no i didn't read three thousand names in one setting but i i kind of felt a duty to read the names so over the course of the day i'd read some i just felt i i should read them and one of the guys who died was david j demeglio I was shocked because he was a friend of mine. Uh, I was practicing law in those days at Jones Day. He was about three years ahead of me as an attorney. He interviewed, I, when, you get, when you get hired by a major firm, it's a whole process. First, you have the initial interview with two people. And if they think you're a possibility, they invite you to come down and interview with four or six people. And if you make it through that, they invite you for what they call a callback to be interviewed by like another 12 people. So you have to go through like 18 interviews. And all you need is, all you need is one that doesn't like you and it's, and it's it. But I got through Jones Day and one of them was David DeMeglio. And he was, as I said, only two or three years ahead of me and a very nice guy. Most uh, major law firm attorneys when they become more senior, uh, certainly at Jones Day in those days, become very arrogant. Even though earlier in their lives, they were like every other first year, humble, modest, but then they become partners and they become arrogant in the worst way. And David was just a delight. I always loved him. And I was uh, very sad. And I remember I, I wanted to, I didn't know what to do. And I thought if I call into his voicemail at the office, they probably have not canceled it yet. And his widow probably could pick up the messages. And I called in a really beautiful, I left a very beautiful voice message for how special he had been. And uh, about three days later, I get a phone call and it starts with sort of like Twilight Zone sounds. Woo! Ooh, it's a voice, a voice from beyond. And it was like really very, very well acted. And he's, it's like a voice from the other planet. And uh, I read, I've heard your voice message. And it was so beautiful that I feel even from the other side, I wanted to get back to you and let you know I heard and anyway, it goes on. Turns out it was a different David J. DiMeglio. I, how many could there be? How many could there be? Well, there's at least two. And uh, he told me he had received at least eight obituary uh, phone calls and a bunch of emails, basically written to his email address with the expectation of get to his wife. And uh, he said, it's really cool to, to know that like people like me and and he was his reaction was like mine. What a shame that the that people don't get to see their their own obituaries because it's often the only nice thing anybody ever says about them. So uh, anyway, with that as background, let's get into Shmuel. And for this, it is very important, and therefore I've prepared for you a 10-minute 
YouTube on the Ark of the Covenant, the Aaron Bris Hashem, the Aaron Brit Hashem. Now, in the Torah, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant, the Aaron Brit Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant. It's part, it's in the Mishkan, the tabernacle. We've been talking several weeks in a row now about the tabernacle, the portable holy temple that the Jews carried through the desert, ultimately setting at Shiloh for 369 years until eventually we move down to Yushalayim. When David HaMelech becomes the king, he makes it the capital and his son builds the Beit HaMikdash. HaKadosh Baruch Hu God decreed that David would never build the Beit HaMikdash himself. There's a discussion, why not? Gemara talks about it. Wouldn't David be the obvious one to build the Beit HaMikdash? And one opinion is, as holy as he was, he killed Goliath and he killed others. And the one who would build the Beit HaMikdash had to be someone who throughout his entire life never would have blood on his hands, even righteous blood. It was righteous to kill Goliath. It was righteous to kill the Philistines. But nevertheless, the builder of the Beit HaMikdash should not be someone who had blood on his hands. That was, that's one Gemara opinion. Another Gemara opinion is just is Punfakir, just the opposite. Not only was David worthy to be the one to build the Beit HaMikdash, but if David HaMelech, if David the king, had built the Beit HaMikdash, God would not have been able to ever allow it to be destroyed. So holy would it have been, having been erected, constructed by David, could not be torn down. And we know that the Babylonians, by God's decree, destroyed the Beit HaMikdash in the year 586 before the Common Era. We came back 70 years later by permission of King Cyrus Koresh, and then by permission of King Darius continued rebuilding it, and then the Romans destroyed it. So there's this debate, and in the end, what David HaMelech did, having been told by God, you will not be allowed to build the Beit HaMikdash, David gathered the materials. He said, if I can't build it, at least allow me, and, and he did. He gathered, it's discussed in Divrei Hayamim, one of the books of Chronicles, one of the 24 books of the Tanakh, that he gathered the wood, and he gathered supplies, and he gathered many of the things that would be used for the building and adornment of the Beit HaMikdash. So that when Shlomo, his son, King Solomon, would complete the job, David would have a, had a hand in it. It's a very beautiful story. Now, until it was made permanent, the Jews in Eretz Israel had a portable Beit HaMikdash that effectively went nowhere. Think of like a, a, a mobile home. Like a mobile home. I, I'm not talking about just a trailer. But a, but, but, but a mobile home, if you've ever been to some of the Jewish uh, so-called settlements or communities in Judea Samaria, when they establish new communities in Judea Samaria, very often in Yudah Shamron, step one normally is they bring in these very, it's not really like a, a trailer per se, but it's like a real, it is a portable home and it gets secured in the ground. And frankly, it could stay there for 30 years, 50 years, like a, like a permanent home. So the Mishkan is not just like a traveling circus here. It's a serious uh, holy temple type uh, place that was carried through the desert and finally in Shiloh for 369 years. And its centerpiece was the, was the Ark. And I'd like you to know a little bit about the Ark. Now, the Ark is important because in the Ark, they kept, by God's command, a piece of man, one piece of the food that rained down from heaven, and it did not spoil. They kept the broken tablets, right? Moshe Rabbeinu threw the tablets, the luchot. It's there. They kept the uh, the staff or the cane of Aharon the Kohen, Moshe's brother, that sprouted in the aftermath of the Korach rebellion. Some of the most important edot, idiot, 
adiot uh, testimonies to the truth of Jewish history. Imagine seeing a piece of man, the broken ark, uh, the broken tablets, the luchot, the, uh, so these were in the Aron, and the Aron disappeared. And that was the fanciful theme of one of the Indiana Jones movies, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Fictional, the idea of Harrison Ford, the archaeologist uh, looking for the Lost Ark. And uh, it's very memorable at the end, what happens to that Nazi when he opens it up. But, but anyway, uh, let's, let's learn a little bit. It's, it's about 10 minutes. And then we go right into the text, and you'll see why for today's class, it's important to cover it. Here we go. Again, thank you, as always, for being here and making these classes meaningful for me to teach. And it's, it's like a secret of mine. You know, when you're in any kind of intellectual job, a job that requires using brains instead of muscle, not that there's anything less honorable about being a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, a welder, these are wonderful jobs. We can't live without people who excel in them. But the thing about being any kind of intellectual, I don't mean smart, but simply being in a field is that you have to keep learning. When I was practicing law as a practicing attorney, I uh, constantly had new cases, had to learn new law, became more and more knowledgeable. And uh, as a law professor, uh, well, after 16 years teaching the same material, I'm challenged less, but there's always new case matter. And my students will occasionally ask me doozies of questions that I need to go and find answers to. One of the great blessings of being a rabbi, and I'd share it with you, and I'm so grateful to you for making it possible for me, is it forces me to learn more Torah. I can't get lazy. I know you're going to be here on Tuesday night to learn Navi, and you're going to be there on Thursday night to learn Mishta. <clears throat> and Rambam, and Sunday, whatever advanced texts we're covering, and it forces me to stay on top of my game. I have learned so much. I'm so grateful to God for having inspired me to pursue a career as rabbi. I learned so much, so much. I can't, I can't get it all in in a class. There's more on an advanced level. The books behind me are real, even if the picture is the background, and I sit and I learn and it's just a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm grateful to you because that's why the shul, among many other things, and you're just the most wonderful of people. The one or two or three times in 14 years that someone not so nice joined our shul because we were just the local shul, we get rid of them, which you can do when you have more than one shul. It's very hard when there's only one shul in a city because. It's especially hard for the rabbi because you can't, you can't really get rid of them because you're consigning a Jewish person to being like a man without a shul. How could you do that? And that's the great blessing of having at least a second shul. You know, there's the famous joke, it's not even that funny anymore, about the man deserted on the desert island and, and they can't find him for years. And one day they like Gilligan's Island and one day they find him and the, and, and the guy shows him around, uh, oh my God, you're still alive. Yeah, I've been on this deserted island and I've made a life here. And he takes them and he shows them, here's a building I built, this is the 7-Eleven. And uh, here's a building I built, uh, this is the Ralphs, the Albertsons, the, uh, the Piggly Wiggly, uh, the place that I can, my supermarket. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, Macy's and here's the uh, outlet store. And you show them around there, here's the, uh, Here's the hardware store, and here's a shul I built, and here's the other shul. And then they, of course, ask, why, why do you build two shuls? He said, well, this is the shul I daven in, and this is the shul that I will never set foot in as long as I live. So uh, anyway, you need that second shul, and it normally focuses on the others, but actually goes the other way too. The rabbi needs that second shul to send those people. So let's learn now. Thank you for your patience, and uh, let's begin with the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, this is an Aaron versus depiction. You'll notice it's, uh, it's, a it's carried by the two, by, by two uh, poles that uh, Levium 
the ladies, uh, they would carry it. It's pure gold. And it has the cruvium, the cherubim. There are a lot of different versions. I was trying to get a good picture. So let me just give you a few of them to see uh, for a moment. There's another version, the, cherub the cherubim, the cruvium. And there's the poles, pure gold. Let's just do two or three more, firstly. Get a good sense of the Aron Bris Hashem. There is slightly different depictions, therefore slightly different cruvium. But you get the idea. It is said that the two angels, the Keruvim, uh, when they looked, when it was a time of peace and love, they would face each other. When Jews were fighting Jews, they would turn away from each other. Just take a few more. You'll notice this one, again, slightly different. All have the same common theme of pure gold. Pure gold. Two angels facing each other, Kruvim, the Aaron Bris Hashem. Let's pull in one more. Again, slightly different conceptions of how the uh, how the uh, design would have been, the lattice work, whether the poles are, are are swirling or not swirling. This one, the poles are not swirling. So it is what it is. Uh, children and parents not included like batteries. Okay, you get the idea. The Ark of the Covenant. So let's now take a moment's look at, uh, at this. And thank you for being here once again. Okay, let's do this. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is one of the greatest mysteries the world has ever known. But what was it? Did it wield unstoppable power to whoever possessed it, like in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? The Bible reveals that the Ark of the Covenant was where God set up His throne upon the earth, and the place where His presence appeared among His people Israel. In the ancient encampment of the tribes of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant was located right in the midst of all his people. And the Bible says that this has always been God's plan to dwell in the heart of his people. The Ark of the Covenant was a small box that contained the actual Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. The Ark first appeared in the Bible during the time of Moses around 1500 BC after the Israelites had escaped Egypt through the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. They were led by the mysterious Shekinah glory cloud, which looked like a tornado during the day and a pillar of fire during the night. This glory cloud led the Israelites all the way to Mount Sinai, where God gave them his Ten Commandments, even though there was rebellion brewing in their hearts. It was here on Mount Sinai that God revealed to Moses the detailed description of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was to be made of acacia wood and coated entirely with gold. The dimensions were 3.9 feet long and 2.3 feet wide and tall, and along its top edge was a king's crown fashioned in solid gold. There were gold rings with long poles of wood overlaid with gold for transporting the ark. The lid on top of the ark was called the mercy seat, and standing on top were two angelic beings called cherubim with their wings outstretched, and they faced each other as they looked down at the blood of a sacrifice, which was sprinkled on the top of the lid by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. The cherubim were hammered into shape from one block of solid gold. They had four faces as described in Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5. They had the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, and the face of a man. The cherubim were also the same fierce creatures who guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned. They wielded a flaming sword that turned in all four directions to protect the tree of life. 
Genesis 3.24. In the Bible, God said to Moses, There I will meet with you, and I will tell you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the Ark of the Covenant, all that I command you for the children of Israel. Exodus 25.22. The Ark of the Covenant was located in the tabernacle, which was God's sanctuary. The tabernacle was a portable sanctuary that the tribes of Israel encamped around as they journeyed through the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant was placed behind the veil in the Holy of Holies, a small room that contained nothing except the Ark of the Covenant. God also appeared above the Ark and between the cherubim when he spoke to Moses. The Ark of the Covenant played a major role in the history of Israel. When the Israelites came to the Promised Land, the Jordan River parted as the Ark of the Covenant led the way, and they conquered the land that God had given them, all the way from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. Later, when their enemies, the Philistines, had captured the Ark, they were plagued with the deadliest of diseases. Later in Israel's history, an Israelite was smitten dead for touching the ark as it was tilting on a cart. King David had become the king of Israel around 1000 BC and brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem with great praise and celebration. It was his greatest desire to build a temple for the ark, but this would be accomplished by his son Solomon. When Solomon became king, he was most respectful of the Ark of the Covenant and had it placed in the Holy of Holies within the first temple in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, known as the Temple of Solomon. When Solomon died, the kingdom divided and there was a civil war. Ten of the tribes followed one king to the north and two of the remaining tribes followed the other king to the south and they called themselves Judah. And Jerusalem was the capital, and the Ark of the Covenant remained in the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible goes on to say that throughout the history of Israel, the people of Israel forsook the Lord and refused to follow Him. They chose to worship the gods of the nations around them rather than seek the presence of their true God. This rejection continued until they finally lost their land. The beloved city of Jerusalem was destroyed and Israel was carried away into captivity. After this, the Ark of the Covenant was never seen again, even to this day. When some of the Jews returned from captivity, they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem and it was referred to as the second temple, the temple of Zerubbabel. There was no mention of the Ark of the Covenant. It would be around 400 years until the coming of Jesus, the one to whom was the true meaning behind the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. During the time of Jesus, Herod the Great had rebuilt and beautified the Second Temple. The New Testament and ancient history make no mention of the Ark of the Covenant within the Temple of Herod in Jerusalem. Well, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? There have been many theories about the Ark of the Covenant, but according to experts, they are only speculation. To this day, there has been no sightings, nor has there been any discovery. The Jews believe that the Ark was hidden on Mount Nebo, east of the Jordan. The Apocrypha gives a reason for this, stating that Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant in a cave on Mount Nebo before the Babylonians came and conquered Jerusalem. It also says that the location of the Ark of the Covenant would not be revealed until God's determined time. 2 Maccabees chapter 2 verses 4 through 7. But what was the true meaning and significance of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant represented judgment and mercy. Judgment if man approaches God and there is no blood to stay the judgment angels. Man would be face to face with the Ten Commandments which he cannot keep. 
mercy if man approaches God with the blood of a substitute. When the high priest entered the Holy of Holies every year and sprinkled the blood upon the mercy seat and between the cherubim, God's judgment for sin fell upon an innocent substitute. According to the Bible, when God saw... Okay. Um, we do benefit from Christians uh, preparing so much good stuff. But uh, we got enough. It's interesting, by the way, I, I don't know how many of you use Instacart. When we get Instacart, we do. And uh, we get an email. Instacart is on the way about an hour or half an hour before the delivery. And then it, there's another email after the delivery is dropped off. Your Instacart order has arrived. And it tells you who delivered it. Fran delivered your Instacart. Dove delivered your Instacart. Yesterday, I got an email. Jesus delivered the Instacart. And I shared it with a thousand rabbis on our list serve, uh, titled the email, A Religious Experience. Jesus delivered the Instacart. And everybody had a line. Uh, the, the emails that came back, my only response was, all I know is that he crossed the street. Uh, okay. So anyway, here we are, chapter three. Shmuel Aleph. <coughs> now, we learned last week that unfortunately the high Kohen, Eli, his sons Chafni and Pinchas, failed to be proper religious leaders. The Hanar Shmuel misherated Hashem of Eli, but Shmuel was growing up as a righteous young fellow. By now, let's put him in his teens maybe his 20s, who devar Hashem hayakar, hayayakar by Amimahim. In those days, God's word, yakar means expensive or precious. What is What makes something precious and expensive? That it is rare. If they had as much, if there were as many diamonds as glass, it would not be so valuable. Same with gold. <coughs> what makes an, a, a metal or a jewel precious is its, um, its rarity. So the word of God in those days was rare, as today, by the way. No act of prophecy. Ein chazon nifratz. You did not have active prophecy. These are the days of the judges and uh, the times of Gidon and Yiftach and Ehud, Devorah, Shimshon, so many whom we've learned about. On that day, Eli Shochev and Kamo, it was nighttime and he was sleeping. By the way, he had become increasingly blind from old age. He was moving in to the age 98. But God's light, his torch, had not yet extinguished for Eli, and Samuel also was asleep, another part of the house, being reared under Eli's tutelage. Eli was not blessed with two sons that would carry his mission, but he at least was given the opportunity to be the mentor of the one who would, who would carry on, Shmuel. So this is the Hechal Hashem, and they slept in the temple of God, Asher Sham Aron Elohim. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. By Shem Shmuel, a voice called out to Samuel, and we know it's called dramatic irony. It's a term in literature generally in literature. The term dramatic irony is when the audience knows something going on in the story, in the play, that the actors in the play don't know about. So we know it's the voice of Hashem, but Shmuel does not know. 
And he answers, he nanny. Here I am. He nanny. Here I am. Bayaritz el Eli Bayomer Hinani Kikaratali. He heard his name called, runs to Eli, here I am. Bayomer lo karati shuvshav. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Bayosef Hashem o karaot Shmuel. Again, God called out Shmuel. Bayakam Shmuel Bayolach Eli. And again, young Samuel hustles down to Eli. Bayomer Hinani, here I am. Kikarat Ali, you called me. Bayomer lo karati. He said, I didn't call you. Bani shuv shav. Go back to sleep, would you? Ushmuel, Terem Yadad Hashem. Shmuel had not yet directly encountered God. But Terem Yigolei loved the Bar Hashem. And God had not yet revealed prophecy to Shmuel. So frankly, someone called your name while you're in bed, even if you didn't recognize the voice, but there was one on the, only one other person in the house, how would you respond? God calls him a third time. And the poor kid comes back to Eli a third time and says, Here I am. You called me. Eli had Bina, Havana. He understood God is calling him. So this time Eli said to Shmuel, Lech shechav, go back to bed, go back to sleep. If you hear your name called again, the Amarta Daber Hashem Kishame Avdecha. Respond from your bed. Go ahead, speak, O oh God, because your servant is, is listening. So Shmuel went back to sleep. Shmuel, Shmuel. And God called out, notice this time the double name. Shmuel, Shmuel. Let's take a look. We're in chapter 3, verse 10. But for a moment, let's take a very quick look at, let's try, I'll try maybe 22. Otherwise, 21. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. At Akedat Yitzchak, when Avraham offers Yitzchak as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, by Shlach Avraham at Yado, by Kachetam Achel Tishchot Abeno, Avraham is about to, God forbid, slaughter his son Yitzchak on the altar on Mount Moriah. By Akra Elav Malach Hashem in Hashemayim, and a voice of an angel of God calls out to Abraham from heaven, Vayomer, Avraham, Avraham. Notice the double name, Abraham, Abraham. And notice the response, Hineni. Abraham, Abraham, Hineni. Interestingly, um, Rebbe and Esther Youngrice, the late Esther Youngrice, she was a Jewish leader, uh, in the outreach community for many, many years, formed an organization to reach out to Jews, and she called her organization Hineni, based on what we're learning tonight, as well as uh, the account I just read you from the Akeda, that uh, when God calls, the response is Hineni, here I am. So as God calls Shmuel, Shmuel, twice the name, and Shmuel says, Daber ki avdecha. As instructed by Eli, please God, speak. Your servant is listening. Vayomer Hashem al-Shmuel, hinei anochi oser, davar v'Yisrael, asher kol shomot etzilene shneazna. I'm about to do something to the Jews that uh, will shake the foundations, or to be more Figurative will cause everyone's ears to start tingling or or burning. <clears throat> By the way, quick lesson in Hebrew, just for a moment. But for the benefit of those like Selma who excel in Hebrew, 
there is a general rule that every Hebrew noun is either male or female for grammar purposes. It impacts the kind of adjective you use. For example, uh, if it's uh, if it's a male noun and you want to say small, you'll say katan. And a female noun, you'll say katana. A small ball, kadur katan. Uh, by contrast, a small girl, yalda katana. So every noun has male or female. By the way, unlike English, most of the European Romantic languages, the Russian Cyrillic languages, most languages work like that. Every noun is male or female, some of which are obvious. Boy is a male, girl is a female. But what about the word door? That's not male or female genetically, but based on grammar rules, in Hebrew, any noun that ends in kamatse, aw, uh, <coughs> is considered female, with rare exceptions. And any noun that ends with a tav, like delet, door, is considered female, with exceptions. Everything else is male, but body parts are female. So an ozen, which does not end with aw, kamatse, or tav, because it's a body part, it's female. So it gets shte rather than shne. Same with, uh, you name it, enayim, eyes, lev, heart, etc. Okay. <coughs> so anyway, God says, I'm about to tell you prophetically what is about to unfold that will cause Jewish ears to tingle. Unfortunately, on that day that is coming, I am going to impose judgment on the house of Eli. It's due. It's long time coming. He's had time to figure out how to redirect his sons, Chafni and Pinchas, onto the proper paths. It has not happened. Time is up. I, even though he is the king, he is the uh, high Kohen, I must now judge his house forever. What does that mean forever? It means what I'm about to do will leave behind no house, no lineage. The lineage of Eli will come to an end. Because he knows and has known for a long time that his two sons are making a denigration and a mockery and a sacrilege of this holy place, and he has not adequately rebuked them. I want to emphasize that, by the way. It's not that he it's not that he has tried the best he can and he just can't accomplish. You know, we all probably have had some experience with our kids on some area in some way that nothing helps. Clean up your room. That's one for one of my kids. It did help 30 years later when she got married. And she, she started going out with a guy, and she didn't want him to see the bedroom the way it was when it was when she was a kid. So she became like Martha Stewart clean. But uh, we tried. God knows we tried. Ailey apparently did not try hard enough. He conveyed to P P Chafni and Pinchas, this has got to change, but he did not make a change. And he kept them running the show. They were not the only other Kohanim in Israel. The Jews were not down to our last three Kohanim. But he kept them in charge. And God says that's it. Lachen ishpati, leveteli, imit kapera von beteli, besevachu vimincha arolam. It's at the point now, no amount of sacrifices on the altar will alter my decision. 
by Ishkav Shmuel at a boker. Shmuel had a restless night, I guess. Says that he went to sleep till daybreak, till morning. He probably had on his heart. How do I, do I tell Eli what I was told? How do I tell Eli? He's the guy that does the stuff. And he opens up. He, he's Eli's assistant, number two. He opens up the Beit uh, the uh, Mishkan. And he really he hesitates and fears. He doesn't want to tell Eli what he's encountered. Eli says, my son Shmuel. Shmuel says, yeah, I'm here. Mahadavar Ashadiber Elecha Al Mimeni. Tell me what he said. Tell me what God said. If you don't tell me everything, like you should be punished. I can handle it. I can handle the truth. What did God say? Eli knew it. It couldn't be great. Because in the first instance, God would have called Eli Eli. Why would he be calling the protege? By Agedlo Shmuel, it call Hadavarim Belochichad Memeno. So Shmuel just uh, just let it all out. And Eli took it the way an honest holy man would. Hashem who Eli said, look, it's from God that makes it good. Hatov Be'enav Ya'asa, everything from God is good. If he's wiping out my line, my lineage, it is good on some greater level. Maybe for me personally, in terms of how we define things, it's not my favorite. But for the eternal spark of the Jewish people, Netzach Yisrael, Lo Yishaker, the Jewish people will be forever, eternal. And if this is what God feels needs to be done, it's good. By the way, the word God, an English word, comes from the word good. It's not a coincidence. And by the way, we have a bracha. We thank God even for bad news. When there's good news, bracha to Hashem, we love you, God, King of the universe. You are blessed. You are good and you make, you do good. And it is not a bracha that is said lightly because it invokes God's name. So it's not like your team wins the Super Bowl. You're a Bengals fan. Or maybe you're a Rams fan. I'm sorry, you're a Rams fan. Uh, or maybe you're a Bengals fan, but you bet on the Rams. Uh, you don't thank God with that bracha except on special occasions. In the same way, though, even with bad news, we say a bracha, Baruch HaTashem Elkenim Dayan HaEmet, the true judge. At, at a cemetery, when burying a dearly beloved one, the rabbi might tear your garment to help you, help you start the tearing of the garment, and you'll say that bracha. Even at this moment of sorrow, we recognize God gives, God takes, and praises the Lord. So Eli accepts the judgment. That's the way a Jew is. You accept it, you accept the bad news. I mean, you go forward. It's an interesting thing out of the Holocaust. So many people after the Holocaust came away saying, I can't believe in God anymore. And so many equal or more people came away saying, after what I went through, it was a religious experience, and I became religious from the Holocaust. It's just interesting how different people with the same stimuli and data emerge with different interpretations. It's a fascinating thing. And indeed, Shmuel grows up. God shifts focus from Chafni and Pinchas over to Shmuel. And it becomes known within the Jewish people, among the Jews, Samuel is a prophet of our generation. And this is an ongoing biblical expression. In the United States, how would you say, the whole America, I've been everywhere in America from north to south. Well, you know what the expression would be that. You would simply say, I've been everywhere from north to south. You wouldn't say, I've been everywhere, I guess, from North Dakota to 
to uh, San uh, Antonio. Uh, although Woody Guthrie came closest with his lyrics. Uh, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York mainland, so from the west to the east. In Hebrew, midan va'ad ber sheva. That's the common expression when you talk about the totality of the land of Israel. Let's see if we can pull her up real quick. All right. Beautiful. Picked the wrong one. Okay, we'll try her again. That should be easier. I've got it up there. Let me just get it for you for a moment. Uh, is it here? Let's try this. Just give me one second. All the blood he added. All right, all right, all right. Got the blood. Uh, here we go. And uh, here you go. Midan va'ad ber sheva. So here's Don. Within this colorful map, the brown stuff is other countries. Moab, Syria, or Aram, Amnon, uh, Amon. The colored breakdowns are the different tribes. And is among the tribes, you have Don is the northernmost. Yeah, it could have been Naphtali, could have been Asher. They choose Don. Midan va'ad Beersheva, here's Beersheva in the south. One more map, same idea. The idea of Don, here's Don north, and Beersheva is south. Minidan v'ad Beersheva, from north to south. Remembering Ephraim is smack in the middle. Remembering that just beneath Ephraim. In Ephraim is Shiloh. So Ephraim is going to be part of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. And when you add the two other tribes of Yehuda and Binyamin, before the civil war division, Ephraim is smack in the middle. And Shiloh, therefore, smack in the middle. Okay. So from Don to Beersheba, everybody knows this is the prophet of Israel. Continuing, chapter four, by Yosef Hashem Leiro opened Shiloh, and God continues making his presence seen in Shiloh because he is revealing himself to Shmuel in Shiloh. For he devar Shmuel lechol Yisrael, by Yitzhak Yisrael lekrat plishtim, la milchama. The Jews have been sinning, unfortunately. You've learned this with me through the book of Shoftim, Judges. When the nation sins, God sends a foreign nation that conquers us and brings us great tragedy. Jews have been sinning and war erupts with the Philistines. And the Jews encamp in their place, Philistines in there, they go to war. And initially what ends up happening is the Philistines kill like uh, 4,000 Jews. They slew about 4,000 Jews. It's a lot of people. Here in Orange County, we have 100,000. That's 4% of the population. 4,000 is a lot of people. It's 100,000 Jews in Orange County. Um, frankly, one life is a lot of people. The nation, they don't recognize in Shmuel a prophet and judge of that level, comparable to Gidon, Gideon, Yiftach. Gideon's the one with the 300 men who bow down at the water and the trumpets, the nighttime battle. Uh, Yiftach is the one who had the exchange of correspondence with the king of the Amorites. And later on, his daughter was the first one to walk in. He had said the first one who walks in, first thing who walks in, I'm going to offer to God. Samson, you never forget Samson. Uh, Deborah, together with Barak, routed Sisera. And then Barak fled and ended up in Yael's tent, where she pounded a tent pin into his head and to him. So the Jews had certain judges who doubled his prophets, Nevi'im, and tripled his military leaders. They did not yet, nor ever would, perceive Shmuel as a military leader. So 
they're at war and they need to do something. And they get the idea of we've lost 4,000 men. Let's bring the Aaron Brit Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant, with us into battle so that God will do the fighting for us. <coughs> This time, let's bring the ark from Shiloh into the battle, and we'll do much better. Remembering again that the Philistines are based in the Gaza Strip. So here's Israel, and here's Shiloh, and the Philistines are based in the Gaza Strip. You go down south along the Mediterranean coast. You have Ashdod, modern-day Israel also. Ashkelon, and before you know it, you're in beautiful downtown Gaza. The Philistines lived in Gaza. That was their central area. Take a look at one other map. Same idea. You're in Ephraim. You have Shiloh here. You're moving towards Ashdod. Ashkelon and the Philistia in Gaza. Gath is where uh, Goliath was. And so that's Gaza. Pretty close to the Negev and Beersheba. If you're in Shiloh, to northern Gaza, it's not that far. So that's what's going on. Okay. So let's go to fight. And bring the ark with us. By Shlacha Am Shilo, by Isumi Shamat Rombrita Shem Tzvakot, Yoshef Akrovim. So they go, they gather the ark, and they bring with them the two sons of Eli, who have to accompany the ark, Chofni and Pinchas. Okay. They bring Chofni and Pinchas. Chofni and Pinchas. And as the ark comes to battle, they start sounding the trumpets, and boy, is it loud. The earth resounds. As the plishtim, the Philistines, hear the loud rumbling of the shofar. Whoa, what's going on? What's the reason that the Hebrews, for goodness sakes, we just slaughtered 4,000 of them? What are they so happy about? They quickly came to realize, aha, the Jews just brought their Ark of the Covenant with them into battle. Not good for us Philistines. Uh-oh. Their God now is with them in the camp. Oi, which translates, you guessed it, oi. That's where the word comes from. To the degree that Jews Say that. Oh, why? Oy, 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 oy. It's a Hebrew word, and it means what it sounds like. Why bother translating it to woe, which is correct? Oy. It wasn't like that yesterday. Yesterday we whooped the Jews, and this don't sound good. Here's your second oy. Oy, oy. Who's going to save us from their God? That's the God that wiped out Egypt. So there's no, what are we going to do? We can't retreat. Once that God's in battle, can't run away from him. May as well stay and fight. And that's what they decide. We have no choice. May as well stay and fight. It chazku, from the word chazak, let's just be strong as we can. The Yulan Shimplishtim, let us be Philistines. Kain to Avdu, la Ivrim Kasher Avdu Lachem, the Tem Lanashim Vinochamtem. We'll just, uh, I have no choice. We'll just have to fight them. Their God in their midst, notwithstanding, because the alternative is they're going to make slaves out of us. All in favor of that? Nope. By Israel, by son of a gun. The Philistines come and attack. 
and they win. They, they wipe us out, a terrible slaughter. With Jews on the beating a retreat, Fatahi Hamaka Gedolam, 30,000. You know, 30,000, 34,000, that is one third the Jewish population of Orange County. Now we're really talking. And what about the Ark of the Covenant? The Philistines had the temerity to seize it during the battle as spoils of war. They took the Aram Brit Hashem. What about the sons of Eli in charge of it, Chafni and Pinchas? They were killed. So the Ark was taken and the sons were killed. And a Benjaminite fled from the battlefield back to Shiloh to report the news to Eli the Kohen Gadol, the high Kohen. That's how news was transported in those days, not by phone, email, text. You had a guy who was really fleet afoot, race to the battle site, get the news, race to wherever he wanted to bring the news. And he goes to Eli. Madav Kruim, his uniform torn to pieces. Adama al Rosho, he's got earth on his head. You take one look at him, you know which way the battle went. Bayavovi na Eli, Yoshev Alekise. Now Eli is sitting on a chair outdoors in front of the Mishkan. And uh, he was actually. Sit, sitting on the Yiddish term would be shpilkas. He was on shpilkas, on pins and needles. Ki hayali bo charid, charid al aron elokim. He was concerned, not about his two sons, Chafni and Pinchas. They were irredeemable, and it's not like they're just bad kids. They were doing bad stuff, very bad stuff. We did that last week. We went over it. So it's not they who have him absorbed, but the Aram Brit Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant is, it went into battle. That never was done before since we came to the land of Israel. I hope it's okay. And here comes this guy with the news. It called Hatsa Akad. Eli, who's practically blind, asks, well, what's all this crying and wailing? And as the guy comes and tells Eli, who, by the way, again, is now 98, and he's blind. And the guy says, I'm the guy you probably just heard about who just arrived from the battlefront. I just today fled from the scene of the front. And Eli said, so, so what's going on, son? And the uh, news transmitter, the reporter, responds, oh, what can I say, the Jews? have fled horribly from the Philistines. And there's been a terrible plague, brackets, that has killed 34,000 Jews, close brackets, among the people. And that's not all. And your two sons, have died in battle. Chafni and Pinchas. And you notice how the news is being given worse and worse and worse to kind of a, a kind of prepare for the next level. And even worse, the Aron Brita Elokim Nil Kacha, the Ark of the Covenant has been taken by the Philistines. And Eli 
does not respond to news that his two sons have died, but the news that the ark is gone into the possession of the Philistines shatters him. He falls backward. He's sitting on a, a chair. Think of like a chair with a backing. Well, most chairs do. He falls backwards and he breaks his neck and he dies. When he hears that the Arum Brit Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant, has fallen into Philistine hands. He judged the Jewish people for 40 years. Remember all the times we learned in Sefer Shoftim, the book of Judges, about the land was tranquil for 40 years, the land was peaceful for 40 years. 40 years is an ongoing theme in the Tanakh. And that's why I'm a little concerned because it's more just a little more than 40 years since Menachem Begin signed the peace deal with Anwar Sadat in 1977, 78, brings you up to 2017, 2018. May it be God's will that the, uh, that the treaty continue to have some kind of lasting effect. So Eli is dead. Chafni and Pinchas are dead. The Aaron Brit Hashem is in the hands of the Philistines. Meanwhile, of the two sons, this Chafni and Pinchas, Pinchas' wife was pregnant. She was going to give birth. And when she hears this news, she dies in childbirth. And what's to say? She names the kid I Chavod, meaning no covet. There is no honor. E, like Ain, Kavod, honor. There's no honor. But in transliterating it, it comes out to Ichabod. If you remember the, uh, the book uh, Rip Van Winkle by uh, uh, Walt, no, Walt, uh, going blank a moment. Rip Van Winkle, uh, about the fellow who slept 20 years, uh, the same author wrote a book called Ichabod Crane, Ichabod. And uh, that's from Ichabod. You get names like this, they show up in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, among the Amish. They have all those great names when they speak to thee. And thou answerest them thus, thus. So this child is born the glory has departed from Israel. But Tomer Galachavod Mi Israel, Kinokach Aron Elokim, chapter five. Third of our chapters for tonight. Uflishtim Lachot Aron Elokim, Vayaviu Meavenezer Ashtoda. And indeed, the Philistines, wow, we've got our hands on the ark. Woo! This is some spoils. So they bring it down to Ashtod. What's doing in Ashtod? Number one, you could see the dot is in the green. That is to say, it's within the Gaza Strip at that point. It's within Philistine land. Today, Ashdod and Ashkelon are Israel cities, and the Gaza Strip of the Philistines begins lower down. But then it was part of the Philistines, and their main temple was there. So they bring it there to show it off. They haven't learned enough from the time they tried to show off. Shimshon, they had Samson, and they showed him off in the temple. And uh, how'd that work out? So they bring him to Ashdod. Their god's name was Dagon. Now you may know that dog means fish. Dog is fish. No relationship to the name Doug, D-O-U-G, Douglas. Dog means fish. And their god was a fish a piscatorial divinity and was depicted piscatorially so. And um, <clears throat> it was just gigantic, a gigantic statue of a fish. And apparently that worked for them. The house of Dagon. 
Etzel Dagon, you know how like a, uh, a cathedral or a, a church has a Jesus on a cross? Like that's part of the, the, um, the, develop, the design of a church. It's part of its, uh, well, however you want to call it, uh, that, they have that big, they'll have a big cross and they'll have, a, they'll have him hanging on it. So in the temple of Dagon, the holiest temple of the Philistines, there's this giant fish. Again, when I'm talking about a fish, I mean, try to at least have something intimidating in your mind. Think of like a whale or a shark. Don't think of like a sardine. So anyway, or, or, or herring or pickled herring with cream sauce. So they place the Hebrew Ark of the Covenant alongside the statue of Dagon. Next morning, some of them come to church, to their temple to do the daily morning prayer. And wow, the big gigantic statue of Dagon has toppled over. Can't figure it out. Was there an earthquake last night? Little tremor, like a 3.1, 2.6. So they pick up the monument and they place it back on its pedestal. Next morning, again, they come to church, to the Dagon temple. And again, Dagon has fallen. But this time, it's fallen, and its head is broken off, and its hands are broken off. It's kind of like Venus de Milo. All you have left is the fish torso, filet of fish. They were so shaken. Now, this book, First Samuel, is written by Shmuel. As Shmuel grows older, he eventually writes this book, which includes things contemporary to him and things from his past, which this story, now present and contemporaneous, will be his past when he composes the book of First Samuel Shmuel Aleph. And while he's writing the book, he makes note that even though the matter of the Church of Dagon and the Ark of the Covenant, which we're going to find out more about, ultimately got resolved to this day, namely decades later, the priests of Dagon would not set foot in that area where the statue had fallen and where the head and, and, and hands broke off. Shook him up. But Yichbad Yarashem El Ashdodim and God gave them a whooping in the city of Ashdod. Interesting term, Techorim, and Ayin Peilamet. It seems to mean hemorrhoids. Hebrew is called Lashon Kodesh, the holy language. We do not have dirty words in Hebrew. It's an interesting thing. You know, when you speak in Hebrew, where you speak Torah, you're supposed to speak with great care and elegance. You're not supposed to be blasé, and you're not supposed to use words with sexual or other body connotations in a blasé way. We live in such a coarse Western society, the language is filthy. On the one hand, you cannot say the N-word, which is fine, but that you sh it's fine, you should not say it, but you can say the F word. You hear the F word all the time. And you hear the C word, which was even in the days when you could not say the F word in the 1960s and 70s, 80s, the rare case where someone would let out an F and everybody around would say, whoa, no one said a C. Now they say C. The whole, the whole, Culture is filthy. And you have to be careful when you speak Torah and you speak differently. The Gemara doesn't use the word sex very rarely. There's a word for it. But like when the Gemara wants to refer to the laws of a husband and wife 
it'll use the word equivalent of when a husband and wife lie together, when a husband and wife are intimate, when a man, the Bible, when Adam knew Eve, knew Eve. Torah talks in a very gentle language. And for the same reason, in public reading, we don't say the word hemorrhoid when we read from the Torah. There's a curse God puts that the people will be smitten with many things, at least to their problems, but they'll be smitten with hemorrhoids. Given where the hemorrhoids are, there's an, a synonym rather than even to say hemorrhoid. It, it's not about the hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids is not a dirty word. But you know, again, going back to even America, in the 1920s, 1930s, people did not say pregnant. She is with child. They didn't say pregnant. You couldn't have commercials for, for, uh, for uh, the blue pill, whatever, Cialis, or the other way, Viagra. You couldn't have commercials for that. You couldn't even give commercials with Kotex. America changed. Now, in some way, that's good. You know, if you don't use the word vagina, and if you don't use the words of the body, I'm sure there are women who died of cancer who would not have died if they had been more forthcoming and expressed to their gynecologist something. I'm sure there are men who needed to tell their um, urologist, proctologist, uh, something going on inside their, uh, that part of their body. I have no doubt that American history has lost many people to cancers who might have lived if they had blurted out something they were just too embarrassed to say that they have a pain in there. So there's that. But at the same time in teaching Torah, and really the way we speak in general, we should speak with elegance, just as you should eat kosher, just as you should keep Shabbat, just as you should daven, you should speak with elegance. So anyway, we continue. So, they decided, the Ashtodians of the Gaza Strip, the Philistines, we think we've had enough of the Ark of the Covenant. Let's give it back. We thought this was cool. Spoils of victory. We conquered their. We don't need this. Give it back. Uh, keep in mind, in those days, they did not have preparation H, and it was their best alternative. So they first decided, let's take it out of the city of Ashdod, and let's bring it to Gath. Let's bring it to Gath. Gath. That's the city from which we later will learn much later about Goliath. Goliath will come from Gath. All right, that's later on. Let's see if we have Gath here. So Gath is there. There he is. Let's take the let's take the ark from Ashdod to Gath. That's the southeast within our boundaries. Good. Is it in this one too? I imagine so. Ashdod to Gath. Let's stick with the other one. It's a little clearer though. Okay. So the plan is, and they're going to bring it to Ashdod to Gath. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is that they bring it to that city and it ends up causing panic in that city. Struck the people of that city, young and old, and now they got the hemorrhoids. Basically, do you have a city you don't like? I can imagine, like, uh, I don't know, parts of uh, Mississippi. It's like the uh, redneck south in Mississippi deciding, we don't need this. Let's send it up to New York City. 
Let those New Yorkers have it. Let's send it up to San Francisco. Let the uh, let the let the uh, the people of San Francisco deal with it. So they send it from Goth to Ekron, and guess what? It comes to Ekron. Oh my God! They start responding. They sent the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant to wipe us out. And they finally decide, let's give it back. Not in, not in Gaza, and not in Ashdod, not in Gat, not in Ekron. Give it back to the Jews. Wherever they was going, was wiping them out. Whoever didn't die ended up with hemorrhoids. And not fun. And so with a few minutes to go, uh, I'll just say one quick Devar Torah on this week's Torah portion. And again, thank you so much for being here. This week's Torah portion is Kitisa. Kitisa includes the uh, effort by Moshe Rabbeinu for God's mercy to please forgive the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf. And Moshe Rabbeinu goes up Mount Sinai, the same Mount Sinai where he had received the Torah scrolls, the Torah tablets, oops, where he'd received the tablets, then broke them when he came down, sing everybody with the golden calf. And he prays to God, please forgive the nation. And God says he will forgive them. God says, I will make my glory pass you by. When Moshe says, Oh God, Moshe says, please let me understand your ways. Some of the things that happen are indecipherable. Not only mysterious, but I can't make sense of that. I want to know you. Because the better I know you and understand you, the better I can serve you. And God says, I can't let you see my face. Again, God has no face, no physical form. It's metaphorical but I can't let you see my face. And Moshe says, I need to see your face. And God says, look, I've explained this to you. Where Moshe is saying, let me behold your glory, not your presence. Let me behold your glory. God says, and here's the key, I will pass you. You're going to stand in this cliff, this, this, this gap here in the mountain. And I'm going to pass by with a, a practically, I guess, a whirlwind. You'll, you'll, my presence will be felt. And you'll feel all my good. And as far as you wanting to understand me, I can't, I can't make you fathomable to my ways. I can't make it that my ways will be fathomable to you. You, a human being with finite capacity, never will be able fully to grasp my ways. All I can say is that I will grant grace to those to whom I grant grace, even if it makes no sense to you, and I will show mercy to those to whom I will show mercy. I can't explain to you. God says, but you won't be able to see my face. That is, you won't be able fully to understand me because no one who would fully understand me would be able to survive what he had imbibed and experienced. 
So therefore, stand at this at this place of the rock, Nitzavta El Hatsur. And when I pass by, Ba'avorch Vodi, as my glory passes by, Visakoti Kahpi Alecha Aravri, I'm going to stick out my hand to cover your face, to protect you from looking at me. Because if you look at me, you cannot live. No one can see my face and live. I therefore will extend my hand, and then when I pass, such that you no longer could see my face, again, it's a metaphor. You'll see the back of my head, but you'll never see the face. And the way I've explained this many times is the idea that when we are so close to God, when do you see someone's face? When you're really close, when you're facing them. When do you see the back of their head? When they're far away and they're going farther and farther and farther away. When God is so close that you could like see his face, very often we cannot understand him. We cannot see him. We cannot internalize what's in front of us. But years later, looking back on something that happened, that is, as we see the back of his head, because distance is now between us, all of a sudden we can see the back of his head. What we couldn't interpret and make heads and tails of at its time, two, three, four, eight, nine, 30 years later, we look back and we say, I get it now. I don't know that I fully get it, but I see something. I see God did this for a reason. And that's something very important that I wanted to share with you from this week's Parsha. I want to thank everybody for being with us. And as always, I end the recording. And if anybody